Hello and welcome back. Now that we have an understanding of cross tabulation, I want to spend some time thinking about the basics of hypothesis testing. So let's begin. To begin with, we're going to remember some of the basics of hypotheses, and we're going to introduce the idea of what's called the null hypothesis. We're going to look at the research hypothesis and consider some of the alternatives to a research hypothesis. Then critical to understanding hypothesis testing is we need to understand what's called type 1 and type 2 errors. And finally, we're going to look at levels of significance. To begin with, remember that hypotheses provide the indis indispensable bridge between theory and observation by incorporating the theory into near testable form. Hypotheses are essentially predictions in the form of if A then B that we set up to test the relationship between A and B. They enable us to derive specific empirical expectations and enable us to assess whether our proposition holds. They direct our investigation. Without our hypotheses, we wouldn't know what to observe. They provide an a priori rationale for relationships. If we've hypo hypothesized in advance that A and B are related, we can have much more confidence in the observed relationship than if we just happened upon it. So remember, a hypothesis is a conjectural statement that specifies a directional relationship between two variables, an independent or cause variable, and a dependent or an effect variable. Critical to understanding how hypothesis testing works is to understand the concept of what's called the null hypothesis. A statistically significant relationship observed in a sample is one that we can, with a high degree of uncertainty, infer also exists in the population as a whole. So let's say we'd observed a sample of children. The ones who did not bring lunches to school perform more poorly on tests than those who did bring lunches. If our sample is large enough and the difference in test scores is great enough, we'd be able to infer that there's a relationship between the nutritional consumption of these children and their academic performance. The idea of the null hypothesis is that there's no statistically significant difference in the values of the dependent variable across the groups of the independent variable. So to take our example further, if we found that there were no meaningful differences in the test scores of the children regardless as to whether or not they ate lunch and any minor observed differences we would contribute as being the result of just sampling error. Now, if the values of the dependent variable do not differ across the categories of the independent variable in the sample, then we would infer that there's no evidence to support our research hypothesis, and we could not reject the likelihood that there's no relationship. So we could not reject the likelihood of what's called the null hypothesis. The decision to retain or reject the null hypothesis doesn't prove sample means are equal or unequal, just that there's not enough or not adequate evidence to reject the null hypothesis. So we have our null hypothesis symbolically shown as the sample means, for example, of one population being equal to the sample means of a second population. So if you think about our sample means of one population being the test scores of our children who had lunch being equal to the sample scores of our children who did not eat lunch or approximately equal. And that's contrary to what our research hypothesis is, which is saying that the sample scores of the children who do not eat lunch are going to perform less well than those who do eat lunch. Great, let's continue. So our research hypothesis is what most researchers are trying to find evidence in favor of. Most researchers seek group differences. As we take our observations and group them into the categories of our independent variable, we look for differences in the values of the dependent variable. If we reject our null hypothesis, is our research hypothesis accepted? No, because we have to confirm that the statistically significant relationship is in fact the one that we predicted. Second, as we're scientists, we never accept our research hypothesis per se regardless. Rather, we'd say there's statistical evidence in support of our hypothesis. When we observe differences in the values of our dependent variable across the categories of our independent variable, the idea of statistical significance tells us that the variation due to grouping things into the categories of the independent variable are probably real, or that we would also likely observe these differences if we were to observe the entire population. So let's go back to our original puzzle here. Remember our hypothesis, children who eat lunch at school perform better on tests than children who do not bring lunch. And our null hypothesis in this condition is that there's no difference in the test performance between students who eat lunch at school and those that do not. So you can imagine 
if we observe differences in test scores between groups who had lunch and do not have lunch, and those who had lunch uh, score higher on, on the test than those who did not have lunch, if the differences are great enough and we have statistical significance in this relationship, we could not only reject the null, but claim that there's statistical evidence to support our research hypothesis. Now think, if we have a statistically significant relationship, the differences are great enough to say that there is a difference between those who had lunch and those who did not have lunch, but that those who did not have lunch in fact scored higher than those who had lunch, then while we would still be rejecting our null hypothesis, there would not be statistical evidence to support our research hypothesis. In fact, the opposite has happened. When we test hypotheses and we make claims about the null hypothesis, we're risking making either a type 1 or a type 2 error. When we reject the null hypothesis, but should have failed to reject it, we're making a type 1 error or we're making a false positive claim. We're mistakenly claiming that there's evidence to support a relationship, but if you observe the entire population, that relationship is not actually there. It's an artifact of our sample. Now, much of the remainder of our course will be designed with dealing with type 1 errors. Type 2 errors are when we fail to reject the, the null, or we're claiming that there's not a relationship between our two variables, but we should have, in fact, rejected it or claimed that there is a relationship. This is what's called a false negative. Now, if the relationship actually exists in the population as a whole, if we sample enough observations, eventually that relationship will emerge. So for the remainder of the course, the only thing we're going to say about type 2 errors or making false negative claims is that to overcome a type 2 error, we would increase sample size. And type 2 errors are most likely present when we have very small samples. If we have very large samples and find that there's not a statistically significant relationship, if we have a, a very large sample and we still do not have a statistically significant relationship, it's likely that even if we observe the, the entire population, the differences between the two subsample scores would be relatively neglig negligible. I didn't talk about in our box here two scenarios. If we claim that we should reject the null hypothesis, and in fact we should have rejected the null hypothesis, we're fine. And if we fail to reject the null, and we should have failed to reject the null, we're also fine. But because we're working in sample world, we always risk the probability of making a type 1 or a type 2 error depending on which decision we make about our hypothesis and the null. So when we make claims about our hypotheses, we're going to make claims relative to how confident we are. Typically in social science, by convention, we would use 90, 95, and 99% confidence to reject the null hypothesis. You would make a statement like, I'm 90% confident that I can reject the null hypothesis and not be making a type 1 error. The level of significance is often expressed in terms of alpha. I want you to think of alpha as the cut point with which we make a decision to reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis. It's a threshold. We can also think of p-values, and a p-value is the exact probability of making a type 1 error when you conduct a statistical significance test. So there's a relationship between confidence, alpha, and a p-value. For example, at the 90% confidence level, alpha is 0.1 and we would need to observe a probability of making a type 1 error of less than 0.1 to be able to reject the null hypothesis. At the 95% confidence level, alpha is 0.05, and we'd need to observe a probability of making a type 1 error less than 0.05. At the 99% confidence level, alpha is 0.01, and we'd need to observe a p-value, or probability of making a type 1 error, of less than 0.01 to be able to claim that we could reject the null hypotheses. So to recap, recall that we talked about hypotheses early in, in the semester and we reviewed just briefly what hypotheses were. We talked about the null hypothesis, we discussed the research hypothesis and how we might actually observe alternatives to the research hypothesis that are actually statistically significant. Finally, we talked about type 1 and type 2 errors and how we interpret type 1 errors relative to level of significance.
Great job, students. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to take this idea of hypothesis testing into our first statistic to test hypotheses, the chi-square statistic. We'll see you soon.